This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite's Pro Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Loctite's Pro Foam line features three new products. The gaps and cracks and window and door items seal and insulate gaps and fit any standard foam gun applicator. Loctite's Fireblock Pro Foam fills gaps while resisting the migration of fire and smoke. Perfect for electrical, plumbing, and wherever a fire-resistant foam is needed. Say yes to Loctite's new Pro Foams. Say yes to Loctite. Visit loctiteproducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. The IRC has only been out there since 2000, so I think it's only been the last, since 2015 or 18. I have to go back. I have books right here. I can look it up in two minutes. <laughs> but it If any of you are uh, following along with your code books, let us know what that section is on <laughs> yeah. Bail Building. I got mine right here. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, a right weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor, Mike Gurton. Morning. Fine Home Building Technical Editor, Mark Peterson. Hello there. And Senior Producer, Jeff Rose. Hi. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. It is great to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, good to be here. Uh, Mike, where are you at? I always have to ask this because you're a <laughs> uh, you know, jet-setting individual. No, no. I, I, you know, I don't – you think I travel all the time, but I'm usually a homebody and I'm, back, I'm here in Rhode Island. What projects have uh, you got going this week? Uh, I went claw hogging yesterday. <laughs> it was a nice went, day. So, You went what? Claw hogging. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that a Rhode Island thing? Or? <laughs> it, it's sort of a Northeast thing. It, it, it's a hard shell uh, shellfish, like clams, hard shell clams. So you're so. waiting in the – are you – Diving, picking these things uh, off the seabed <laughs> floor. <laughs> I should do a video and put it on uh, put it on my Instagram so you can see it. But it's uh, yeah, you use a rake. Uh, I, I use an old style. It's almost like a well. It's you use a rake and you rake in the, the 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 either mud, gravel, or in the case where I claw hog, it's it's rocks about you know base softball size rake through those and then get down a couple inches and there are these uh claw hogs i should have brought a couple down and put them up on the screen i you should have shared them with us <laughs> do you eat them do you eat them like oysters or do you put them in soup what do you do with them? all kinds of things you can make chowder out of them uh like clam chowder that you get in new england are usually made from claw hogs huh oh interesting um, and um the uh, or a lot of people eat them raw, like my wife. <laughs> I don't eat them. <laughs> I haven't since I was a teenager because I was force fed them as a kid. Yeah. So now uh, I, but I do like catching them because it's. Well, I say catching them. It's like it, it's like digging up rocks <laughs> <You're> not, essentially. <laughs> right. They're not. They, they're not very fast, so they're probably easy they're, to track. No, they're not fast. But they're. <laughs> you know, it's it's a, it's just a nice way to be out on the shore, oh, where not, there aren't like a, a lot of people on a nice afternoon. Is there a season to this practice, Mike? Uh, around here, it's year-round. So it's mm-hmm. not like uh, some shellfish like, uh, like scallops. Usually it's just the uh, fall, the R months, September, October, November, December, uh, are, are like shell, are, are scallop months in Rhode Island anyway for open season. But, but for quahogs, it's year-round. Uh, you How won't fun. find me out too often when it's, uh, you know, five below zero Fahrenheit. You won't find me out there <laughs> digging them. <laughs> but when it's, uh, you know, 72 degrees and nice low tide. Yep. Cool. What about you, Mark? What you've been quahogging in uh, no, Kentucky? No, I never have. I never have done that. There's it. 
Yeah, no, that sounds like fun, though. Um, no, it's just, uh, what have I been doing? I've been working. It's funny because what I, so I finished up my PVC trim and all, I, I had to trim around all my lights and exterior and, you know, vents and all that. And putting that stuff together is fun, but cutting it is miserable. Um, the now I'm, surprisingly, now I'm painting. So that'll be, that's a nice, uh, it'll be a nice discussion after the, after the podcast, because we're discussing painting. So I'm doing, so when, so I had LP installed, uh, smart side and you know, it was pre-painted. Well, they go along and they, they nail on the trim. Well, you got, na- then you got, you know, nail holes in your trim. So I'm just going back and putting a coat around the trim and kind of caulking, you know, it's been a year or so if any gaps, you know, just filling in gaps and caulking the trim. That's what I'm doing. Do you enjoy that work, Mark? No, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, painting is not one of my. I'm I'm impatient by nature, and I'm I, I tend to be kind of a the type of person who bowls ahead and then goes back and fix all my mistakes afterwards. And I still get done fast, but yeah, I'm gonna. I, I, I'm I'm someone who leaves ropes and drips and mess. And yeah, no, I'm just not. I'm not cut out for it, but this isn't so bad. You know, it's just, it's really just a small roller and, and a bucket and go around and filling up holes. So that's not too bad. One thing Before, I was surprised at is, you know, this is new siding. I was surprised I couldn't track, the, you know, I'm surprised that LP doesn't have a, some type of relationship with, with the, like a Sherwin Williams where it's like, all right, this is the color I have. And you just go in there and, you know, this is the paint that you need. It's just surprising that they don't do that. However, on the other side, I brought in a little sample of trim, and it's amazing how close they can get to the finish. It's just unbelievable. You know, I figured it'd be close enough so the trim, you know, next to the siding, you're not going to notice a difference. But there's places on the siding that it had little touch-ups, too. It just, it's invisible. It's just unreal how well they can do with those color matches. So did they use an electronic uh, matcher, Mark? It, yeah. it is. And and to be fair, this is, we're talking white, but it's, you know, even on, you know, so if it was a dark, if it was black or something, it might be different. But it's just, I mean, it's literally invisible. Yeah, they just did the little, I don't know how they do it, but some type of little electrical scan. Yeah, very cool. I've done that a number of times with different paint companies where I've had, uh, where I buy a, a house, one of the, you know, one of the houses I buy to either fix up and sell or, or keep and rent. And I have no clue what the paint color is that's on the exterior. And it's probably either faded or got some kind of discoloration. Mm-hmm. I've brought in a, you know, a couple of paint scrapings. They've matched it. I paint the house like, you know, a couple of uh, areas and you can't tell. It, yeah, it is unreal. remarkable. It is. It is remarkable. You know, I bet if you called up LP, they could give you a formula for whatever paint. No, you're saying nope, no. I did. That was the first yeah. thing I did. And they just said, wow. they all the only thing reference they had was trim, aluminum trim coil. They did have a list of, oh, if it's Rolex trim coil, then you want this. And so they had a spreadsheet for that, but not nothing for paint. Huh. Wow. Are you listening, LP? That's inexcusable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, you, and, you would, and you would think that even Sherwin-Williams would just say, get a sample of all their stuff and say, hey, here's a spreadsheet, put it on your website. And then they're, right. you know, kind of the premier go-to people. So right. I'll, I'll take a percentage of your increase in sales if you're listening, Sherwin-Williams. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they're not consistent enough. That's the other thing. Uh, I thought maybe from plant to plant, you know, maybe because there, you know, there's probably several plants around the country. I mm. thought of that too. Maybe it's, yeah, or and, yeah, and that I, would that something would definitely like that. Or if, it's them. Been si- if it's sitting around for a year before it goes on, it could change, I suppose. Now I've been on a couple factory tours of uh, some uh, siding manufacturers that do their own pre-finishing, and they were very. Uh, they they would they were effusive about oh here are the colors we use this is the man, you know manufacturer of the paint and we're so consistent that you could match the same paint you know five or ten years from now or or backwards forwards and backwards with matching paint color and I'm really surprised that LP isn't on that same kind yeah, of a program it, it is kind of surprising 
I think if Jeff is on to something that they probably got burned where the colors didn't match exactly, and yeah. uh, now now they're on the hook, so they're now they don't tell anybody. But I, I've worked with, I don't remember the products exactly, but I have worked with other products where they said, if you're going to get Bear, get this. If you're going to get Sherman yeah. Williams, get this. Yeah. And they picked the, you know, the top four or five or whatever. Are you painting, Jeff? Not anytime <laughs> soon, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have fall projects? I, you know, I think you'd agree something happened in the last week or two that we moved from uh, late summer into early fall. Yeah. Um, well, it's supposed to be a nice weekend, so I'll probably do some stuff outside, but, you know, nothing major. Uh, Mark mentioned earlier that today's podcast after show is going to be about exterior paint jobs and clear finishes. And uh, this was brought to mind by a recent photo shoot that I had this week in Vermont photographing a uh, clean of a natural cedar clapboard house and uh, later it's going to have a clear finish put on it and um, I hadn't really thought about it much but it takes a very committed homeowner to have a clear finished house and it takes a good builder you know when you have putty and caulking uh, you can do way more mediocre carpentry than you can when you have a clear finish on a house. All those joints have to be tight. Everything has to look perfect because it all shows at the end. And uh, I, I, I'll put a photograph of the house I was shooting on the podcast page because it is a beauty in a field in Vermont. And uh, you, you mentioned you had some questions, Mark. I do. So what am I – I'm looking at the photo right now and you see – you know, two sides of the house are clear cedar, and you see a guy spraying something that's really dark. Almost looks like it's got a walnut finish on it. It's super dark. What are the, what is that guy spraying? What are they doing? So the the white side or the lighter side is cleaned, and that is the side that they are working on. And you can see if you look at the trim above the windows, the uh, brown streaks of dirt and old finish that are running down this house, and the transformation between when they start and when they finished is very dramatic. Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like, well, it's like I said, it's going from like a light pine color to a dark walnut color. And so that is finished. That's not just aging, right? That's if there's a, they're removing a finish. What are they spraying on exactly? So it is a, a, a citric base soap uh, detergent and they use soft wash technology where they, um, you know, use chemicals to clean it instead of pressure washing you know if you take a pressure washer to a wood siding you will destroy it quickly um, yeah especially so, soft cedar yeah yeah so they uh they use chemicals to clean it and then they use a um an acid brightener after the base clean which neutralizes the cleaner and brightens the the surface of the uh trim and and clapboards and it must be i see they have the some landscaping plants below covered up are they capturing that water or is it natural? Is it not toxic enough where they can just let it, you know, they can cover the plants and just let it go into the soil? It's so diluted. Um, it, it's not an issue in the regard to the ground, but you don't want to get it on your tomato plants, right? Uh, it would not be good for them. So they, they wet all the landscaping and the vegetables before starting and they wet it ongoing. They actually did that elevation of the house that you're looking at because it was the greatest chance of rain. And unlike a lot of exterior finishing projects, you can do this in the rain. Uh, and it's arguably better because stuff doesn't dry out. The last thing you want is for these cleaners to dry out on the siding or on your windows, worse, mm. uh, and kind of spots, staining, what have you. So there's a guy on a lift in the background. What's he doing? He's like, so there's a guy standing 30, 20 feet away from the house and he's spraying the way up into a gable. And then there's a guy in the background on a lift. What, what is he doing? So he's applying the uh, cleaning solution. The guy with the hose is rinsing it off and keeping the windows wet and, you know, the plants wet and making sure that nothing dries on them. Um, so is he, that guy's surface. spraying, he's just spraying. So he is, so the, the guy in the background, he's putting chemicals on and the guy spraying, he's just spraying water to wash it off or he's got chemicals there too? No, the water is just, the rinse water. is just water. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Man, that's just amazing. What, what a difference. It's incredible, yeah. right? I would encourage anybody to go. And that's a nice photo. I mean, that really shows what's, you know, the, the stark difference. Well, I'm looking forward to the after show. I kind of wish uh, we'd have done this one last week because I got two phone calls from uh, a listener, home building reader, uh, this past, over the last few days, asking me just about this same 
thing. He's got a red cedar house, and it's wasn't had no finish on it. It's faded on a couple of sides, so the different sides have different uh, uh, appearances because there was never a finish. You know, the sunny side looks different than the north side. So he wanted to know what he could do to revive it so it all looked uniform and then what he should put on for a finish. So I think the article you're coming up with would be like just what he needs. Yeah, so the author, the contributor is Noah Cantor, and he submitted this. Uh, he told me a couple years ago it's been floating around. And, you know, folks ask me how you get an article in fine home building, and uh, a lot of things have to come together, right? We need we need the right location. We need the right project. We need the permission of the homeowner. We need a, um, a willing contributor. Uh, we need time in our schedule to go photograph it. You know, I was gone uh, three and a half days to do two days of shooting, right? So, yeah. So when will the uh, when will this article appear in the magazine? Do you do you have it on the ske- schedule yet? Every time I you know make promises <laughs> yeah, like that, it just bites me. Uh, <laughs> so my hope is uh, we'll have it in a spring issue because it'll yeah. be perfect timing for that kind of project. Super fun. I was reminded how much I love Vermont, and uh, you guys can see what a beautiful spot I was in. The weather was nice. Um, you know, interestingly, folks always assume we want bright sunlight for our photo shoots outdoors. That's actually very challenging conditions to be photographing mm-hmm. in because uh, it is. But yep. this house had cloud cover the first day, and somehow the sun was coming from exactly the right angle f- all day long for the second day. So I can't explain that, but it's better be yeah, lucky than good. Birds. Yeah. And uh, Mark. Uh, my host, I took my first Airbnb uh, lodging experience uh, oh, on this never trip. Done that before. No, it was wonderful. Uh, the, the great part is it was so close to the job site. I was looking at hotels and, uh, you know, the expression Vermonters is you can't get there from here. Uh, to stay in Burlington <laughs> is, uh, you know, 40 minutes away, but it's, you know, 20 miles uh, because of just the topography. Yeah, there's and they're everywhere. I mean, you could think of the most remote place and you'll find, you know, that's that like you said, it, there's not a hotel where we're within 50 miles and you'll find three, you know, Airbnbs within, <laughs> you know, wherever you want to be. I was staying in this gentleman's um uh three-car garage and the in-law apartment was above it and that's where his Airbnb unit was. And it was really nice. He was he's a former uh engineer and you can tell because there's light fixtures everywhere. There must have been three dozen light fixtures in this like 500 square foot uh, <laughs> loft space and receptacles everywhere. So I think he was some kind of electrical engineer. <laughs> well, um, we'll talk more about the uh, exterior finishing in the after show. And uh, if y'all are all access members, thanks very much. And if you're not, I hope you'll consider it. So, Mike, we might as well get to your feedback from uh, the <laughs> show a couple of weeks ago. Um, you, you know, the great thing about this job is I learn new stuff all the time. If for a curious, as someone curious about building, I have the ideal job, but you described a WRB installation method that I had never heard of. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it was interesting, um, how sometimes I'm on the podcast and when I'm not on the podcast, I listen to what you, in, in this case, uh, you and Ian were talking about, a listener, Steve, who had described the way they were installing the house trap, and both you and he were, were trying to figure out, puzzle through why they were installing the house wrap after the windows were installed and after the flashing was installed. And he said, that's not right. That's not right. But in fact, one of the great things that I've had over my career is being able to work in different parts of the country, just for different reasons, either helping out manufacturers or doing trade shows and meeting contractors around. And there are the, the way that we sort of like east of the Rockies or so install house wrap is we put the house wrap on the walls first, then we'll do our pan flashing for windows and doors. Then we put the window and door in and then we put flashing tape around it. But in uh, particularly in California, they do what's called the West Coast installation for house wrap. And they'll install and flash the windows first and then put the house wrap on later. There's some nuances to the install. And the main reason they do that 
is because, as I understand it from talking to contractors, uh, because of the seismic zones that they have there, the inspectors want to inspect all of the nailing of the wall sheathing because it's so integral to keeping the buildings stable during an earthquake. So they don't want the house wrap on at that point. But at the same time, the inspectors also want to inspect that the windows are installed. So they've got, so they'll, they'll, uh, the installers will flash the windows. They'll put flashing tape around the flanges, just like you would on a, a, an Eastern install over the house wrap, but they'll put it over the wall sheathing at the bottom uh, under the windows before they put the flashing pan in, they'll take a, what they call an apron piece. It's maybe a, a foot or two tall by uh, a couple feet wider than the window opening. They'll staple that just along the top edge under the bottom of the rough opening. They'll leave the bottom of it loose. And then after they put the window in and it's all flashing tape in, then they'll put the house trap after the inspection, of course, They'll tuck it under that apron piece for the lower sheet, and then they'll go over the entire wall with the house wrap. And then they have a couple ways of detailing and sealing the house wrap that's been cut out in the inverted U around the uh, the window itself. They can put flashing tape over it, or they can put house wrap tape, or in some cases, they just put some caulking to seal that that those loose edges down. Uh, I've used that here in the east, particularly on remodels, uh, in some cases when we're putting a window in and we got to get it in quick and we don't have the house wrap on. And it's a, it's a viable alternative, though many of the house wrap manufacturers don't have it as their face forward installation detail. It's sort of their, uh, if you go on their website and you search through their, you know, 100 page catalog of all the construction details to install product that's where you'd find it uh, but you go out west and it's pretty common yeah have you heard of that's, this mark I, yeah oh, absolutely and in when i well first of all when you do uh, when you're replacing siding and the windows aren't being replaced i mean that you, you don't have a choice so uh i i when i was in my siding days i took a couple classes to be a certified tyvek person so they put you on your list you know so so they take the classes and Tyvek back then anyway, that was kind of a, I mean, if you were to look at their installation instructions, that was a total legit install. I mean, there was two different, you know, it was first, of course, they wanted you to wrap the, the WRB inside the opening and do it that way. But uh, that was, yeah, that was this very second instruction was how to do it when the windows are already in. Mm -hmm. And I never saw it until... Um, you know, a new construction until the big national builders, because, you know, up until, I don't know, mid 90s, there were no national builders in Minnesota. It was all local builders. And now I bet you, poof, eight out of 10 houses are probably built by national builders there, which is kind of sad. But um, the, you mean the that's when I first, so, so those guys started doing it, because, yes, part of it was, I mean, they just had, they had a crew that just did the house wrap, and a crew, you know, to frame it, of course, and then a crew to do windows, and a crew to do, the, the siding company wouldn't even necessarily be the one who puts a tie back on, so it hmm. was, that was the first time I started seeing it. So yeah, no, it's a legit. And there was a there's a different way, and I don't recall it now. But when I was working with Marvin, Marvin had a. It wasn't called the West, but even, even when you were doing, um, and maybe you've heard of this, Mike. Even when you were doing a new install, and you would tuck, you you'd wrap the the WRB inside the framing, in really high windy zones, and somehow there's a you know a lot of times in the West, in the mountain regions especially, and in the plains like Nebraska, Iowa. Um, you would leave the flap, and I don't remember what, but you'd leave a flap underneath. Do you remember how, how that worked? So I think what you're talking about is after the house wraps installed and the windows installed, but before you put the siding on, what, one of the details Marvin shows is what's called the high-pressure wind skirt. Yeah. And it's just a piece of house wrap. It could be six inches or a foot wide, and they run it maybe six inches past left and right of the bottom of the window. And you just take house wrap tape and you tape it over the top of the flange. So you're not actually trapped. So typically with an Eastern install, you caulk the sides and the head 
as before you install the window, but you don't caulk the bottom where you have a pan flashing. And that way, any water that does get collected in the pan flashing can weep out behind the flange. So by putting this apron on, you only tape the top edge of that, a that the, the uh, piece of uh, house wrap to the flange, but you don't tape it to the pan, which would be kind of behind the flange. So you're not going to trap water. What it does is water would flow behind this flap, this apron. And then what it prevents is wind-driven rain sure. that might get in that joint between your siding or your trim and the window from blowing down and up and into the pan from under the flange. This is sort of a deflector. Um, and yeah, I've been that's it. doing that for many, many years. Oh, okay. On, on all installs because it, it, it's very it applicable hurt. in high wind zones mm -hmm. and, it, and it gives you a, a secondary advantage with, well, we can, we can go on a whole sidebar. <laughs> we could t take up the rest of the mm -hmm. uh, show. But it really doesn't cost any extra money because you always got scraps take around. A scrap piece, and exactly. It, and it doesn't hurt out. anything. It's no, not going it to trap water. It's Yeah. Yep. And, and you get big benefits out of it. I don't know if we've ever done a, That'd be a good little article, a little tip to throw in. We should illustrate. Is that unique tip? It's funny that you remember it, and I worked at Marvin, and I couldn't remember exactly how it worked, but I've never actually done it. So it, have you seen it with other manufacturers? Is this a Marvin thing only? Uh, uh, DuPont Tyvek uh, has it in one of their construction details, um, and that's where I learned it many years mm -hmm. ago. It, it, it's like a lot of things. You know, builders in different parts of the country come up with this thing and say, an idea. Say, I'm going to do this mm -hmm. because, and here are the reasons, and it looks logical. Then a manufacturer looks and goes, hey, that's a good idea. They put it as an optional instruction. Other builders pick up the idea or think of it on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, and if, uh, and if one thing I did learn at Marvin is the testing that they have to go through. The reason it seems like manufacturers are actually slow to adapt really common sense practices are because that testing is expensive and it's time consuming. So, and if they change anything about the assembly or the windows itself, they have to retest it. So, it's if you're wondering why they're so slow to sometimes adapt what seems like common sense, it's just because it's just an expensive process to go through. Yeah, they Common don't sense is always behind. expensive. Yeah, they, they and, don't what's want to really, and, and what's company. funny is, I shouldn't even say this, but they have huge, the big players have huge, not huge, but they have legal departments that honest, honestly, what their job is to go to track the other manufacturers to make sure that they're, and if they find them breaking the smallest rule, either in language or in some type of testing, that they report them, and it's really kind of it's kind of a dirty side of the business, but it's it's a it's a thing. Well, I want to thank our uh, listeners, including Mike, uh, always for sending us your feedback and telling us stuff that we don't know because uh, it makes the show better and keeps us honest. Uh, James had a suggestion for Brian sinking uh, porch piers. Hey, podcast crew, I have two major thoughts about Brian's porch pier situation. One, don't do anything permanent until you've had one full winter without any additional settlement. Since it's only been one through winter, it seems like it might settle again. Uh, two, you could try pouring an extension on top of the pier with a larger diameter so that it stays seated despite the cold. And James included a little illustration uh, indicating what he's talking about, but... Um, with the larger diameter, the kind of uh, it caps the existing pier and prevents it from sliding side to side, which I think is a good idea. You know what? Well, I couldn't find this podcast. What could you describe it to me quick? So Brian put a little uh, portico on the front of his house, a covered entryway, and uh, put the piers in the overdig, and uh, almost immediately they started settling. So I think he told us it's sunk about three inches, and mm. um, he was looking for a solution to that. I, I would caution anybody about using the suggestion that James uh, suggests, which is putting a cap over the pier that's currently there that's larger than the diameter of the pier. And the reason, heating, right? Exactly. Because yeah. what can happen is if the soil is up to the bottom of this cap, which is extending beyond the edge of the pier, the footing that Brian's already poured, that any of the soil nearby, if it does get frozen earth in it and it heaves up a little bit, it'll actually take the whole footing and jack it up out of the ground. Um, it can be done, but it's you've got to be really, really careful uh, when you have anything extending 
what I call a mushroom footing or a mushroom pier. You just don't want it shaped like yeah. a mushroom. If anything, you unless want the it mushroom, narrower. Unless the top is on the bottom, the top of the mushrooms on the bottom. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a. Uh, I poured a little. I, I built a little porch off the back of my house, and it was and it's sitting on it, six feet of fill, and I. And I kind of, you know, I mushroomed out the bottom of the footing, so you had a bigger surface area. But I'm still kind of anticipating that it's going to sink. So if it's, if it's, I kind of did it in such a way where worst case scenario, I could actually just replace the post with the longer one. Otherwise, I just plan on, I, I put the bracket in such a way that holds a post to the footing in such a way that it, I can shim up underneath it if it's, you know, less than an inch. So I'll just check it next. I'll check it a couple times a year and keep an eye on it. Honestly, I think that, you know, as builders, we should make stuff like that adjustable because you never know what's going to happen, right? It's easy enough to, to fix it. Um, well, and, and on the back of my house, I have, it's another area that I'm going to build a big pergola that I'm a little more concerned about sinking. So I am going to spend the extra money. And this is where the helical piers really are handy. Mm -hmm. If you know you have areas that are loose soil with the helical pier, you can go down, you know, you'll... It, by definition, you're going to hit solid soil and it's going to not move. So um, for my pergola, I'm going to have to do that. Is that uh, easy enough to find someone to do that in your area? They're, you know, um, probably not. not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, haven't, uh, I haven't started shopping around. It's getting more. I think five, ten years ago it would have been difficult, but it, it seems like there's more and more franchises. And, and it seems I like think that's, that's a, a franchise. franchise opportunity for you, Mark Peterson. I think you should be the <laughs> metal post installer. Right. I can think of worse ways to make a living. Those things are so cool. They are. Uh, this comes from Doug. Hey, Patrick and team. On the after show discussion of building, building, hidden building costs, I'm glad you brought up site work. We had a completed plan for a house with walkout basement we were going to build on a hill on our property. Before committing, I paid our excavator to do an hour of exploratory digging. Everywhere he tried on the hill, he hit rock about two feet <laughs> down. It would have required $25,000 in blasting, so we decided to move down to a flatter area on our land and had our designer modify the plans to eliminate the basement and go slab on grade. Even with the change, we had to blast for the footer and septic line. That's life in the mountains. Well and septic can also have surprises. We do not have a water table as such. You have to hope to hit a pocket of water in the rock. We had a woman witch our well and drilled where she said, even though every logical bone in my body says this is bunk, <laughs> at 300 feet, we got 60 gallons a minute. But one quarter of a mile away from us, a neighbor went down 575 feet and got water that is undrinkable. Landscaping was really not a cost because of Colorado water laws. With only two acres, our well permit does not allow any outside water use. Gravel is the primary landscape feature. It was good to hear the experience of other owner builders. 60 gallons a minute. That's crazy. That is so wait, much wait, water. Witching? Is this, is this what I think it is? I mean, is this the same <laughs> witching that's on, on the Dowsing, show? That's, in, yeah. that's incredible Dowsing, yeah. in like the late 70s, early 80s. A I don't believe mob? it either, but I, I hear I, I, I hear it works. I don't, you know, huh. explain that to me. My grandfather Jeff, was a dowser. Yeah, yeah, that's right. My grandfather, uh, he he was, you know, an old time farmer, um, built, born in the late 1800s. And when my parents were uh, planning their house where my mother now lives in the early 60s, uh, my grandfather came out and, and there are different ways of doing it. But he cut a sapling from the area, little tiny stick and with a, a Y where the branch comes off the trunk and he, and he held it out and he goes, you'll hit water at 10 feet here and you'll be all set. <laughs> and they went down nine feet and the guy <laughs> okay. digging, cause back then they just dig it with a backhoe as a surface. Well, he said, I can't go any deeper because there's so much water coming in. Huh. And though they did run out of water once over the last, 60 years that one time where it it did run out of water it was mainly because the it had silted in you know it had fit back filled in to about seven feet deep so we just went down the bottom hand dug it out and as soon as we got down around nine ten feet plenty of water was it just a sand then, point at sand point at the end of a or was it a, a it was just well? a, it, it, it was a it was a hand it was a backhoe dug well with well rings so it's about two feet in diameter so hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, I, I unfortunately did not inherit that, uh, that ability from my grandfather. <laughs> I wish I had. Jeff, what do you think about this as arbiter of logic? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, logic it has nothing to do with this. <laughs> right. So uh, Carol professes to have this ability that she learned from, a, I believe it was an art instructor at Carnegie Mellon. So, the, you know, these, these, these folks. Carol uses uh, uh, pieces of a wire coat hanger uh, that, like in little, little sticks, and when they cross, they're, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there are several different ways of doing it. But, yeah, you, you, gotta, you, have, you need your divining rod, whether it's a metal one or or a, or a wood one and uh and then boy you watch the old guy there was an old timer near us uh hank johnson so you can't pay a dowser or a, or, a, or a water witch to do the work if you pay them then they lose their ability so it's always like a barter thing so with hank it was like hey hank i got a six pack of beer can you come up and give me a hand <laughs> Uh, we need so do you to... give him the beer before or after he dows it? <laughs> <laughs> well, Hank was incentivized by the beer. And, uh, man, when, a lot of the wells in our area, which and a lot of people nearby us, they, they have wells that go dry regularly. But all the wells that Hank did back in the 60s and 70s, they all, they'd never gone dry. So this is pretty cool. Uh, this comes from Jameson. Hello, FHB. I've suggested having a home inspector on your show in the past. The industry has changed a lot in the recent and is very interesting time to be in the home inspector business. In episode 591, you had a long conversation about an energy auditor for a newly purchased home. You were talking about making sure there were no bulk water issues, no combustion problems, and talking about an energy auditor finding leaks and electrical issues with this thermal camera. If there was only someone who would look at all these things and also look at the insulation, ventilation, and other building science considerations, oh, wait, there is a qualified home inspector. <laughs> it surprises me a bit. Nobody even considered this as an option, and I think it speaks to misconceptions about our industry. We have changed from providing a basic opinion about buy or don't buy to now becoming a building consultant who teaches you about all the parts of your home. Again, I would suggest you having a home inspector on the show, especially a high quality inspector, to help people understand the value and importance of a home inspection. In Massachusetts, where I operate, we bring on building experts like your own Mike Gurton to ensure we are highly trained in as many of the home systems as possible. We do more inspections after the purchase than ever, with everyone waiving their inspections, and I get hired by builders and homeowners alike to help diagnose and prioritize problems, regardless of how long they've owned the property. Hopefully, knowing where to start for a homeowner like this will save them far more than the cost of an inspection in the long run. My two cents. Well, Jameson, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we don't mean to disparage the home inspector uh, industry, but uh, as you point out, uh, oftentimes they were kind of, I don't know, didn't point out a lot of stuff I've heard that, uh, you know, contributors to fine home building and my friends have found later that the home inspector did not find in their inspection. So maybe that's why I did didn't you, jump Well, you had, I mean, you were getting grief, I don't know, a couple of years ago, Patrick, for, for, hating on inspectors. And then you had an inspector, I think he was from California. I think I listened to that podcast. It might've been the pro talk. So that was a good, uh, that was an interesting conversation. It really depends on anything. I mean, there's contractors who are terrible and there's inspectors yeah. who are terrible and there are inspectors. We worked with, um, at the magazine in Minnesota, there's a, uh, if you ever have someone on Ruben Saltzman, he owns structure tech out there in Minnesota. And he's, he's, I would, I mean, he knows as much, if not more, about the construction of a house and what to look for than anyone I've ever met. So they're out there, good ones. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think even if they don't have some designation, hire a good contractor to check out your place, uh, someone that you trust or work with or have friends who have worked with. It's, it's worth getting someone to look at your place if you don't know what you're looking at. And no matter who you do bring in, they're not going to be able to figure everything out. You know, the home, every home is, is so complicated in things that we can't see uh, without destructive investigation, you know, pulling apart walls and floors and roofs and ceilings. So, you know, it, it, you, you may not always get, not, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying the information you get may not be 
full, holistically complete. It's, it's almost an impossibility. And experience counts for a lot because if you, if you have an inspector, maybe he's the smartest, you know, he's got the highest IQ in the state, but he's only been doing it for a year. He's probably not as helpful as somebody who's knows. I mean, there's certain neighborhoods where, you know, the neighborhood, it's, it's an 80 year old neighborhood and all the houses were built the same. And you've been to four other houses in that neighborhood. And you've seen the same thing. You got a totally pretty good agree. idea of what to look for. So experience. And you learn matters. the builders and their idiosyncrasies and potential problems or solutions right. they might have come up with. Yeah. Because they looked at your neighbor's house or the neighboring house. I uh, don't mean to disparage home inspectors ever. Just find a good one. Uh, this first question comes from Carl, and uh, this came uh, to us through Green Building Advisor, and I'll put the link to the conversation up on the podcast page if you want to check out what folks on GBA are saying about it. Uh, Carl asks, old house on a field stone slash rubble foundation. The exposed portion of the foundation are pointed with mortar. The non-exposed portion, i.e. the exterior and below grade sections, uh, are a loose jumble of random shaped field stone that flares outwards to a width of several feet as you approach approach its base. The stones throughout have substantial voids between them. I, I'm unclear whether this has always been the case or whether 200 years of water has washed out the fines into the cellar. As I work to improve the grading around the perimeter and, and install underground gutters beneath the eaves, I have easy access to the very top of this void network. Should I do anything to fill them? The voids are substantial enough that they are either pea gravel or a watery concrete or mortar would somewhat flow into them. The local vole and chipmunk populations would be very unhappy with, with me, however. Um, what do y'all think? You gonna fix this? Well, I mean, if, and it sounds like, so the French, I mean, the underground gutters, I'm assuming they're talking about some type of French drain system. What is, what uh, do they mean? Go by ahead, them? Mike, you can explain that. So uh, on a, the underground gutter, I think that Carl's talking about is uh, it's a membrane, usually like EPDM or PVC, something that's fairly durable that you uh, m uh, attach maybe six or eight inches below grade at the foundation level. You slope the soil away from the foundation and then you lay this material three, four, up to maybe six feet away at a slope and then you put you know, crushed stone or rubble stone on top of that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way to reduce the amount of water that's coming off the roof of the house, even if you have gutters, mm -hmm. still some coming down, to shed it away from the perimeter of the house at grade level so that it re reduces that uh, water burden that the foundation experiences, which is a really good idea for a, one of these old rubble and field stone foundations, which are notorious for uh, having water just cascading Boring. into the in, inside of the basement. How about the question, is this the way it was built or has water moving through this assembly washed all the mortar out of the, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. It could be either so, way. Yeah. So, I mean, excavating, and you want to be careful because you don't want to excavate this whole around because it could just crumble apart. It's a house apart, of cards, right? right? <laughs> yeah. So would you also recommend going a little bit deeper, though, and maybe putting a dimple board up against uh, the stone? When, Whenever – so there, uh, the house next door to me that I used to live in was built in 1735 on one of these foundations, and there are just literally dozens of them up and down the street where I live. And one thing we've learned over the years from making the mistake, don't excavate on the outside unless you're prepared to be reinforcing that old foundation because the soil is keyed in with all of the stones on the exterior. And you could inadvertently, without knowing it, move one little rock, which is a keystone, and now a little portion of the foundation above it will start to uh, shift and you don't want that. So yeah, we just leave them alone. <laughs> leave so the alone. underground gutter is a good idea because you're you're doing the probably the best you can without causing any problems. I think it's probably okay to point on the inside, but I would definitely yeah. not be doing any digging on the outside. Uh, or, this comes from. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was. Uh, this comes from Seth. Uh, Hey, podcast team, I love the show. Thank you so much for all the knowledge you share. I'm a remodeling contractor in northern Wisconsin, and I specialize in addressing building performance conundrums. 
Now I have a bit of a puzzle with my own house that I'm hoping for some help with. I built a straw bale house about 17 years ago. I put up a post and beam frame, infilled with straw bales, and then plastered them with earthen plaster and then lime plaster on both the interior and exterior. The earthen plaster is a mix of clay and sand, both from my yard with a little straw. I do not have any sort of vapor barrier. As you might expect, warm, moist air migrates into the walls during the winter and freezes on the interior side of the exterior plaster. Come February, as temperatures outside warm a little bit, the earthen and lime plasters essentially rehydrate, crack, and fail. I see this rehydration on the north wall, but much more significantly on the gable walls. I've tried put, putting some round aluminum soft vents in the wall up high on the gables, but it didn't help much. I recently put a large addition on the east side, which completely covered the east wall, and when I pulled the plaster off to patch it, I found the straw to be completely mold-free and intact. Now a large section of plaster on the west side has failed and fallen off, and I need to address the problem. I'm considering removing all the straw down to the top beam, which creates the bottom of the gable triangle. Then I would seal this area off from the rest of the walls with plywood installed horizontally on top of the beam, frame it in, insulate with cellulose, and side it with board and batten siding. My hope is that with the gable area sealed off, the vapor will diffuse more evenly through the rest of the walls. My other thought is to allow significant venting through this area, but my concern is that moisture will still condense inside the walls. I heat with a wood stove and a wood boiler, which heats my finished slab floor. I have an HRV and bath fans and will plan on a better range hood in conjunction with this solution. Of course, all of us straw bale builders laughed at the inspector who said we needed to paint the interior plaster with vapor barrier paint because he didn't understand that straw bale houses needed to breathe. If I knew then what I know now about building science, I never would have built my house this way. I could do that layer of paint now, but it would make any future lime plaster repair nearly impossible, and I wouldn't be able to get behind interior walls, etc. My addition, by the way, is a double stud wall with dense pack cellulose and taped plywood sheathing. I have completely encapsulated the east gable wall in the addition, so I'm hoping there is no vapor drive in that direction. Since I built the addition, that wall looks fine. Thanks so much for any help you can offer, Seth. Oh boy, this is a can of worms, Seth. <laughs> hey, we should phone up uh, Matt Milham for uh, answering the question <laughs> here, right? I, have you ever worked on a, a straw? straw home either of you no i have not i have not my it strikes me as a bad idea frankly heaving, yeah my experience with straw bales is heaving them up to the second floor of a barn <laughs> well <laughs> you know that's about how, it. i mean i i've never even come across um come across these doesn't that sauce or the straw settle it doesn't i mean you'd think it would settle two feet from uh, if it was a tall enough wall well, the, the building is, a, in this case, a timber frame, so the, the, the bales are only infill, right? They're the insulation right. and envelope. Yeah, no, yeah. not structurally worried about that, but it just seems like you would have a two-foot gap at, you know, between that top beam and the, and the straw after a dozen years. So the one thing, the only thing I could, that I thought might be missing, so he added, I'm assuming he added some of those little round soffit vents up, you know, under, on the wall itself. First thing I would do is probably maybe add a couple more at the bottom so you get, you know, sucking in at the bottom. I don't know. But air's not going to move through these straw bales. They are really dense. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, oh, they can't be that dense. Air's got to move through them, doesn't it? If they're dry. We so, obviously say none of us know anything. About <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I, I, I go all, whatever we say, so, you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> I, I think one of the great aspects of the podcast is hopefully someone who knows more about this subject right. will write in because honestly, I don't think we are qualified, Seth, to give you any advice on this. I would really consider furring over the uh, plaster and putting normal siding on this, but I don't know how you affix furring strips or nailers to straw bales. I mean, if there's enough frame... Uh, from the timber frame to fasten to, that would work, but I don't know. Like I so said, maybe it, there are folks out there who have a better idea. One advantage to the way that Seth built the place with uh, the timber frame and the bales being just the infill is that if any section of the hay bale system is just like a problematic, he can just remove it and then put in the double stud wall with cellulose and 
tape plywood seams. In other words, you can actually do a repair to this much right. easier than a structural straw bale house where the straw bales are bearing weight of the roof and are the structural walls of the building, which is much harder to remedy problems with. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> that's, that's the full extent of our knowledge about yeah. straw bale homes. Our, Although yeah, they, our they advice is find somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about. The amazing <laughs> thing is, the amazing thing is that the IRC has a whole section about straw bale, and it has prescriptive measures on how to build a house with straw bales in an appendix in the back. Seth, I think you're better equipped to deal with this than anyone. You, you know, you have been building these things for uh, longer than any of us. So I, uh, let us know what you think of, and if there's anyone who's listening to the show uh, who has thoughts about how Seth can fix his straw bale house, I'd be grateful. How long has that been in the code, Mike? It's been decades, right? It's... Uh, 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 I didn't think it was decades. I mean, the IRC has only been out there since 2000. So I think it's only been the last, since 2015 or 18. I have to go back. I have my books right here. I can look it up in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but if any of you are uh, following on with your code books, let us know what that section is on <laughs> yeah. straw bale building. I got mine right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a 21 code. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. What version you got, Mark? 21. My most recent is 2015 that I have here. Oh, boy. Ouch. I know. <laughs> well, because, because we can re get them all free online, so there's no it real is, need yeah. to buy the book. That's right, true. Patrick, you, don't, you probably refer to the 18 or the 21 just with a, uh, by going to the ICC site now. So easy, What's funny easy. is I'll look up the tables and sections in, uh, in this one and then go in look, the new version. Yep. Then uh, you know the number you're they, looking yeah. for, right? I honestly think we should have stopped at 2015 uh, anyway uh, and see how things work out before we change it every two years. <laughs> well, their changes aren't that big from one version to the, the next. The insulation requirements are crazy, Mike. I think you'd yeah. agree. The, the diminishing returns we've gotten to, especially in roof assemblies, is nuts to me. I was teaching a class uh, two days ago for uh, new contractors here in Rhode Island who have to take this five-hour class that I teach. And um, I was just mentioning, because there were some older builders there um, who were coming back into the business or whatever. Anyway, I, I mentioned that when we adopt in Rhode Island the 21 code, which will – actually, we're adopting the 24 – uh, International Energy Conservation Code in uh, January or February come up, 24. And the requirement for the roof is R60 for attic insulation in our climate zone. And every, all the old guys, their heads just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see them all exploding. Um, they're, they're like, um, they're trying to imagine how, how they can get deeper uh, roof right. rafters, right? Well, you're going to have to. The heel on those rafters is going to have to be two feet tall. Well, you know, the, now there you get into the, um, that's when you got to dive deeper in the code. If you can do a continuous layer of insulation that's equally thick from exterior wall to exterior wall, you only need R48. What you need R60 is when you don't, do raised heel trusses, and now you've compressed the insulation around the perimeter, so you're not getting the full R value out of that, you know, first. So they're they're like doing through. an average, right? They're they're, so, they're right. So, yeah. So if you do a raised heel, you really only have to go a foot high with the raised heel, because that'll get your R forty eight mostly all the way across. I wonder if the code, the people who are writing code, which is everybody, I mean, but you know, it. it I wonder if they take an account, because if you ever look at the fine print in either, if you're blowing in cellulose or fiberglass, that stuff settles. So, and you lose quite a bit after the first, whatever, even five years. So I wonder if the, I wonder if that's taken into, because nobody goes back in 10 years and adds four inches of insulation to the roof. It just, I don't, not that I, I've you don't? heard of any. I <laughs> Do you? Every ten years, you, you know, go up there, yeah, and I go vacuum it, yeah, clean but all the I, dust. I out. would guess there's probably some of that kind of figured into, you know, the, what the goal they're after, or maybe well, not. That's why I, I use the insulation vibrator for the loose fill. You put the vibrator up there, and it vibrates, and it all settles down. 
So you already, so you're already doing. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm making stuff up here. Come I, I want to see the tips and techniques uh, entry in the next issue of Fine Home Building. How you consolidate your insulation for better R yeah. value. That's pretty take, cool. Take an Arky wall banger and uh, put that on your ceiling after you do the blown in in the attic <laughs> to settle it down. Yeah. Like changing uh, the air right in your tires. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, you don't do that, Jen? No, <laughs> You don't want stale. that stale air in your, yeah, right. stale. your tires. <laughs> oh man, this I, I don't know this I, this show today is it's a it's a it's a mixed bag. I think you all would agree. Um, Time for this another comes question. from the seventy four Impala on GBA. Uh, we're getting ready to move into a new place for a while, and the garage is separate from the house. It's stick built with OSB sheathing and T one eleven siding. I'd like to insulate it and get ready for the zone seven winters we have in northern Wisconsin. I may need to work on a vehicle project. This is a duplex, and we are only planning on living here a couple of years max, so I don't want to invest too much. Would Tyvek after fiberglass bats cause any problems? I'm wanting to have an air barrier more than vapor since the vapor goes through the Tyvek in and out. I just want to maintain the heat I temporarily need to keep in the enclosure while I'm working. Would poly be a better choice? I have some Tyvek left over, so the cash would be mineral mold for it. Same thoughts on the ceiling. I'd like to put some baffles in at the eaves and put up the Tyvek, then strap underneath it with two buys and the ceiling before blowing in cellulose. I need to practice cellulose for another project. Uh, any thoughts slash suggestions would be great. Thanks. 74 Impella. What do you think he's going to be working on? A fair amount. It's not going to be a uh, yeah. It's not going to be a Honda. I guarantee that. So, uh, so we, can you put Tyvek over fiberglass bats and have a reasonable assembly? Anyone? The short well, answer is yes, but the long answer is no because you can't leave Tyvek exposed on the inside because it's not rated for fire uh, flame spread. It's 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 a fire hazard potentially. Uh, so so what do you mean exposed? So oh, in other words, he just wants that. So he's not going to cover. I see. Right. Okay. But that's, yep. but it's a garage. I mean, as far as safety, it might not be safe. But as far as does that since it's not a dwelling, does that code apply still? For, so from a building science perspective, it would work. But from a safety perspective, and I would think in a garage, you might be a little more likely to have a fire haphazard, especially if you're pulling out torches and, you know, brazing something together on an old car. Uh, so I'd, I'd be careful. You know, I've looked, uh, actually DuPont has, they have an install in, uh, instruction manual on using uh, Tyvek as a, as on the interior air barrier. So the company but is itself, it left is it left exposed in that situation? I, I didn't see it. It's just a one pager and it didn't look like, you know, there was fine print at about, you know, 0 0.05 font that I couldn't read. But um, <laughs> so I'm not sure. So DuPont does have a product. It's called Tyvek Fire Curb, and it's intended. It can be left exposed. It's 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 an ignition barrier. Really, uh, I however, bet you that is expensive. If I had to guess, I well, you know where the big expense is going to be is the import fees because it's only sold in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! It's, yeah, DuPont has a lot of cool products that they don't sell in the U.S. that they have in the European market. But. So what if he was to get the fiberglass just with the craft facing on it? Is that – can that be left? That's, You're not so supposed that, to leave that that's not fire, either. That's not yeah. treated with any kind of fire retardant? No. There are Is some, there a good way – we only have a couple minutes. Is there a good way to make a reasonably uh, uh, airtight insulated assembly that doesn't cost a gazillion dollars? And I'm going to say – drywall yeah. fire tape drywall yep. and uh the garage is going to be yep. way nicer after you yep. do that anyway and and if you know if he's thinking he wants to take it down and take it with him just put enough screws to hold the sheet on <laughs> to, like you say just a, a quick coat with the drywall <laughs> tape you can cut the sheets and take it with you when you leave you know if it's a, if it's a rental or something you know what but do you think the moving company charges for a stack of sheetrock <laughs> yeah. in the back of the truck? And then, and but you know, make sure you get your worst enemy to do the the lid part of that if you got blown insulation on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, drywall used to be really cheap, but now drywall is twenty bucks a sheet. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's down come from down what a it, bit. yeah. 
When I was oh. building at Habitat, I want to say it was like seven or eight dollars a panel for an eight footer. How about yeah. uh, just is the, does oh, I mean I had a shop. Uh, part of my shop I used instead of drywall. Did I use the whole? F no, it was just one. The part that wasn't heated. I I sheathed the whole interior uh, with OSB mm -hmm. because I liked the idea of you know when I was hanging stuff I could hang little brackets anywhere I wanted and I didn't have to worry about drywall messing around. I just painted it white and it was it was great. I don't know if that's got the, a, a fire rating to it, but it's got to be safer than having. Tyvek exposed, I would imagine. That's, I think that's a really good idea because you could just put some tape over the joints to get the air barrier effect. And, and even just putting the sheets up is going to do 95% of the air leakage anyway in a garage. So you'd, pro you'd probably be fine with that. And it'd be more durable, especially moving uh, equipment around inside of a garage. You bang the walls, the OSB is going to take a lot more punishment than Tyvek and or drywall. Yeah, I had back in the day. We, you know, we installed vapor barriers, and so it was fiberglass and vapor barrier, and then covered with OSB. Well, so if any of you poly? listening, yeah. So what about covering it with poly? I don't like poly because it doesn't allow any drying, right? It's now you're committed to drying in the outside direction, and depending on what's on the exterior, that may or may not work. Well, I hope anyone who's listening who has a suggestion on how to have a uh, reasonably airtight insulated garage with uh, not a lot of money will write in with their ideas because, once again, I think that's a valuable conversation. Well, stay tuned for the after show. Uh, excuse me. Stay tuned for the after show, uh, All Access members, because we're going to be talking about exterior finishing, paints, and clear finishes that last a long time, are uh, durable and good looking. So there's lots to talk about, and uh, I hope you'll stay tuned. And if you're not an All Access member, I hope you'll consider it. Thanks, guys. Good show. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thanks to Mike, Mark, and Jeff for joining me. Thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thanks very much for listening. And happy building. <laughs>